Mina, Ohio Gazimus, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. It is kind of dark outside, but it's the dark of the dawn, because as usual, I stayed up pretty much all night. Pretty standard for what I do. Um, and coming at you today with a 30 minute message, because I've missed, well, actually, I've missed two, so I actually still have to make one up. And that is coming. Um, I will make reparations for the days that I missed. That is upcoming. Today's message is going to be on the topic of why doesn't God destroy evil, as you saw in the title description. And this was all inspired by an amazing anime that I just recently got to watch, One Punch Man. It's, <laughs> it's so, so great. I love the way... Now, I'm going to take a few minutes to just ramble on about One Punch Man. Why? Because it's my video. It's my YouTube channel. I can do that if I want to. Freaking love the way... I don't... I don't... I don't Remember, I don't think I even looked up what the mangaka's name was, but the creator of One Punch Man did such a fantastic job of parodying the entire shonen slash seinen, more or less so the shonen manga style, like the giant series, Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, Bleach. I would say particularly Dragon Ball Z because of the sheer power involved, and the way he just, it, it, there, there's no leveling up for this character. He's not just going to one day become the ultimate hero and have a power that will smash the very heavens themselves. He has that power from the get-go. In three years of training, and it was only physical training at that. And not incredibly difficult physical training, according to Genos. <laughs> he just one punches his way through everything. No bad guy in the series stands a chance. No hero in the series comes close to matching him, no matter how much they want to. Genos himself said that he could never, ever picture himself having the amount of power that his master possesses. With all of his cybernetic enhancements, regardless of whatever training regimen he would go on, he could never picture himself having that kind of power. Moomin Rider tried to stand with the Deep Sea King with all of his natural humanness and got completely crushed and defeated, and couldn't stand. And so Saitama comes in, dude hits him, he does like a bobblehead type thing for a few seconds, and then just one punch, and that's it. Blows out his guts, and that's the end of that guy. It's so... And his final move in the final episode. Serious series. Serious punch. And it splits the clouds across... An entire ocean. It's so great. I just love the way... Hello, camera. I love the way the entire shonen like concept of manga is parodied in that show. And evil does not stand a chance. No other hero, not even Tatsumaki and all of her lali tsundere kawaii-ness, could possibly stand up to Saitama and his power. Apparently they had a skerfuffle in the manga. Haven't read the manga. Um, probably, honestly, won't. Especially with Season 2 coming out soon. Looking forward to that now. That should be really good. Once again, all of this made me think, why doesn't God just take his power and get rid of evil? It would literally be just, ONE PUNCH! And that would be it! Yes, I've been waiting to do that since I started this episode. I have totally wanted to do that since the beginning. And it was totally worth it! Please don't click away, but I'm not sorry. But please don't click away. It'll be worth it, I think. We'll find out. If God has all this power, why doesn't he just one-punch everything that is evil out of existence? Why doesn't God do that? Well, there's good and there's bad news um, with this question. I have what I believe is a biblical Bible answer to that question. And a lot of you guys are probably not going to like it, but... I'm going to share it with you straight like I always do. I'm going to tell you, to the best of my knowledge, what the Bible has to say on the subject. And feel, feel free to correct me or rebuke me or just troll me in the comments down below. But I'm going to give you what I believe to be a solid interpretation of the Word of God. The good news is that one day God will one-punch all evil out of existence. And I base that on Revelation chapter 20. There are other passages as well, but this is like the one that I'm going to use kind of like to propel this message forward. It's Revelation 20, starting at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So this is like 
the end of time. This is the end of days. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, there is coming a day of reckoning. Every single person will stand before God and receive a just judgment for the works that they have done. Every single one of us will receive a proper judgment um, and get what we are due. Um, whether you love people or hate people, it kind of doesn't matter because God's the one who's going to sort it all out in the end. He does have a plan, and he has a book that tells him, basically, it says, it's the ultimate naughty and nice list. Everyone who is nice is written in this book. Everyone who's not written in this book will be cast into the lake of fire with death and Hades, which is the Greek word for hell, in, in case just anyone out there didn't happen to know that. So death and hell cast into the lake of fire as well as anyone not written in the book of life. Now here is, so that's the good news. Evil will, everyone will answer to God for what they've done. And anyone not in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. So evil will most definitely be um, punished forever and ever. And there will be a reckoning once heaven and earth have fled away, once the end has come. And interestingly enough, whether you're a Christian or some other religion or a non, or I should say, not just a non-Christian, that comes as everyone that's not a Christian, but if you're an atheist or a materialist or a physicalist, um, even you will acknowledge that this universe will have an ending point. The heat death of the universe, if you're not familiar with that term, Google is your friend as always, essentially, existence as it is will not be around forever. There will come a point where everything dies down. Literally, everything, the universe will stop expanding, everything will collapse in on itself and be reduced to nothing. Um, how that's going to happen, how long it's going to happen, what will happen afterwards, all those things are theorized. But pretty much everyone, everyone who's looked into the, the, like, the ultimate future of the cosmos, whether they're religious or not, has concluded there's going to be an end. And even if there wasn't an ultimate end, we humans know if somehow everything were to go on forever, we humans know that we are going to die one day. That doesn't necessarily solve the problem of evil, but it does let us know that there's going to be an ultimate end for each and every one of us. And every religion also, and even non-religion, agrees that there's going to be an ultimate end to the universe as a whole. Um, there will definitely be a one punch. Biblically, I believe it's going to be far worse than simply a physical death or the non-existence of everything. Now here is the bad news, and this is some. If you've been in church or around um, evangelical conservative Christians like myself for any amount of time, this pro that what I'm about to say next is probably not news to you. The bad news is we're all evil. We're all bad. The Bible uses the word sin or sinner, which ba if you boil it down to the basic concept, a sin. It, the, the idea here, especially behind the Greek word, is like you're shooting an arrow, you, un, you unleash it, and you don't hit the bullseye. You miss the mark. That's essentially what sin is. You missed it. You didn't get it. Now, the, and that sin, well, the Bible defines what sin is in several, um, in several places. And I'll, I'll look into that briefly, but essentially we have all sinned. We've all missed the mark. We've all missed it. Um, and that makes us sinners. And that's in Romans 3.23. Again, if you've been in church or been around some, you know, bible thumping Christian like myself, you've probably heard this before. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Now that there is actually a very brief, like, summary of what Paul said before that. So to go into more detail... I'm going to back up, same chapter, it's still Romans 3, but back up to verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. 
They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And Romans 3.23 is a summation of all of that. We're not, we're not good, folks. We're not, people are not inherently good. We've all messed up. Um, we've all sinned. We've, and this goes beyond just making a mistake. This is an impure heart. This is an impure impulse that we all have. And just, just to cover something very, very basic, something, again, if you've been around a Bible thumping Christian, you've heard this before, the Ten Commandments. By the way, those are located in Exodus chapter 20. Just to cover the latter end of that, because the first few commandments really have to deal with um, your relationship with God. Um, you, know, there, you won't have any other gods before you. You won't bow down to idols, keep the Sabbath, and don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so if you're not a Christian, um, you're not, you weren't born into a Christian household, you may not be an idol worshiper, but, and you, you may not have any gods before you at all, period. But that automatically pretty much put, that probably puts you in a position where you are using the Lord's name in vain. By the way, the Lord's name is Jesus. Since that's the God of the universe, that's the name that's taken in vain. So if you just say Jesus or Jesus Christ in the middle of nowhere, if it's not a praise to him or a prayer to him, you have used his name in vain. Um, to use it to do something in vain is a sin, the definition of vain that you're looking for there is worthless um, or not not really thinking about it, not really intending anything. It's empty. It's meaningless. That so it's in vain. So when you use his name in vain, it means you're using his name in a way where you're not addressing him or talking about him respectfully. If you're angry at a situation or something frustrates you and you hear someone say, oh, Jesus, or Jesus Christ, like that, that is using God's name in vain. I personally don't like the other, if you just say, oh, God, I personally, and I've heard a lot of people just say, oh, God. I per While some Christians do look on that very poorly, I personally don't care too much about that. If you watch any of my video game videos, you know that very well. I don't believe it's taking his name in vain because God is not his name. It's like we are humans. He is God. It's who he is. That's not his name. I know many Christians will disagree with me on this, and you are absolutely entitled to disagree with me. That's my understanding. Um, God's name is, in the Old Testament, Yahweh. That name's not really used anymore because it was forgotten over time, which I really find silly, but that's not the point of this message. But we knew, do know for sure now that his name is Jesus. So if you say Jesus or Jesus Christ, and you're not addressing him, or you're not addressing, or you're not talking to him, or you're referring to him inappropriately, then that's using his name in vain. And then there's remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. A bit debatable on how to keep that, and the purpose of this message isn't to explain the Sabbath, but to say um, a lot of people don't take necessary breaks. Um, people that are workaholics, more than likely, you've probably broken that rule once or twice. The ones that we that would probably hammer a lot of us, like the honor of your father and your mother, that I'm just listing a few sins here. There are plenty of other things to find in the Bible, but here, here are some things that a lot of people are going to be able to identify with. Honoring your father and your mother, we've pretty much all goofed that up. Some worse than others. Unfortunately, I'm in the worst category. When I wasn't a Christian, I really did not treat my mom right. Um, and I am very, very sorry that I didn't do that. That was incredibly disrespectful of me, especially in light of how much she loved me. Um, you shall not murder. Hopefully, <laughs> a lot of people watching this video aren't guilty of that one. It's a little scary if you are, but if even that sin applies to you, there is hope. There is forgiveness, which I'm going to get into. Um, you shall not commit adultery. And if you take the whole thing about if you've looked after your, if you've lusted after your neighbor's wife in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. If you take what Jesus said there, that's in Matthew chapter 5, I believe. It's definitely in the Sermon on the Mount between Matthew 5 and 7. Um, if you take that into account, I think pretty much every male and female 
is guilty of this sin at that point. And adultery is actually not incredibly, statistically speaking, adultery isn't something uncommonly done. I wish it was, but apparently it's not an uncommon thing, at least not in contemporary America. It's a relatively common problem that several people have fallen into. You shall not steal. That, and I'm not going to say, you know, if you accidentally took a paperclip from work or took a pen from your job and you came home, you're like, oh, crap, I need to return this. Or you're like, oh, well, I have a new pen. I don't count that as stealing. I know some, some Christians do, some preachers and evangelists do. I personally think for it to count as a sin, period, there needs to be some intent of your heart there. Like, you are out. You were out to take this thing that you were taking. This wasn't simply a paper clip or a pen from work. This is like, you know, when you were a kid and you took the cookie from the cookie jar. You meant to take something that did not belong to you. In the process, you also dishonored your mother and your father. So good job. You, you, you killed two birds with one stone there. Good job there. Uh, and I think we're probably all guilty of something. Maybe not a cookie jar, but something along those lines. And then quite a few people are guilty of like petty theft, um, petty larceny. That's not, not everyone's done it. I think we've all done the cookie jar thing. But a lot, still again, just like the adultery thing, stealing is not incredibly uncommon. A lot of people are guilty of small stuff that most either fellow, their fellow associates at work in particular will look over or their friends will look over because it's not a big deal. That is still outright theft. You would be tried in a court of law, and you will answer for it before God on the last day. And then you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Biblically, that's more along the lines of perjury. On a smaller scale, not bearing false witness, that's essentially do not lie. Come on. Which one of us at some point in time has not told a lie? We haven't necessarily committed perjury. So you could probably say uh, you haven't technically broken that commandment you could probably get away with that but as far as lying in general goes kind of like the adultery thing you may not have borne false witness in a court of law you may not have committed perjury but let's be honest if we're going to take it to the level of the heart and what's going on in here and something we do in our day-to-day -day lives that's maybe not criminal maybe not legal but something that deals with the honesty and the truthfulness of our hearts, we've all made that mistake. We've all fallen into that. And then the last of the Ten Commandments, it's kind of a catch-all. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Covetousness, jealousy, envy, greed. This, and in nowhere in the Old Testament, in the middle of all the laws, I have read through the entire book of Moses, or the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I've read through the entire Bible. Nowhere is there a legal penalty for this covetousness, because, you know, how there, we don't have a thought police. There, thank God. Oh, my gosh. Talk about all of us being doomed at that point. Um, there are no thought police. There are no mind readers. Even though there were people in the Old Testament and the New Testament that had a prophetic anointing, that was never re done. It was never counted as like a sin where you had to offer a sacrifice in the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, you, you know, Jesus talked about all these things on the level of the heart. He addressed all of these commandments at a more heart level. But even in the Old Testament, there was that tenth commandment where if you haven't done any of the other nine, at some point you fall in prey to greed, envy, jealousy. At some point, we've all fallen to that. In that tenth commandment, it's the catch-all that pretty much condemns all of us. And like I mentioned, the thought police earlier, I didn't look up this particular verse, but there is a verse that Jesus, that G, the, blah, blah, blah. English, Jesus' words, Google's your friend once again, that every action, every word, and every thought will be brought up at judgment. God knows your heart through and through. He is the thought police, and you will answer for that. And at that point, we can pretty much say we're, we're all evil. According to this standard, we're all evil. We've done something wrong. We have sinned against God. I'm not trying to push necessarily the old church line. I'm not trying to, 
not trying to make anyone necessarily scared of God, like, you know, watch out, or he, you know, God's looking out for an opportunity to bash you. He's looking for an opportunity to condemn you. Um, he's just waiting to send you to hell. I don't want to send that message across, and I'm not here to do any fear-mongering. I'm not here to do that. I'm here, especially at the end of the message, I'm here to offer hope. I'm here to offer forgiveness, repentance. God loves you tremendously, as I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Um, God's destiny for you is not hell. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Once again, you can look that up with good old Google. The, de the devil and his angels, that's why hell was made. Not for humans. Not for you if you're watching this video. That's not why it's there. God loves you tremendously. At the same time, you are a sinner. You have messed up. You've missed the mark. And if anyone's thinking, well, I've done a lot of good things, so the good things should outweigh the bad things, so I won't necessarily get one punched at the end of time. You know, I've got all this good on this side. And, you know, you're not going to say that every single act outside of Jesus is evil, are you? No, I'm not. I'm not going to say that. Obviously, non-Christians can do very good things. Um, anyone doing some kind of, you know, charitable giving, walking the old lady across the street, you know, pledging some money to, uh, you know, the firefighters and the police force in their local community, you know, just going out of their way to help their fellow man. Obviously, those are good things, and they're not condemnable. I don't think I don't think by anybody. Good gosh, I'm like, why would you condemn an obviously good work? But good works, please listen to this, good works do not excuse bad behavior. If you, let's, let's take something really, really minor, something really, really small. Um, you're standing before a court of law, and you haven't killed anybody, and you haven't, like, you know, robbed a bank, you haven't, or assaulted anyone. You haven't done anything like that. Let's just say it's a speeding ticket, something very minor. You were going 10 miles over the speed limit, and, you know, you were written a ticket, you stand before the judge, and the judge is, okay, you know, um... You know, here's, you know, how do you plead? And, and you say innocent. And, he's, and he would say, okay, why do you plead innocent? You know, did the officer, I, I don't think any judge would actually say this, but let's just, hypothetically, the judge would say, you know, it, was the officer lying to you? And, and you were like, well, no, the officer wasn't lying. Um, I did go over the speed limit. And, the, and then the judge would say, well, okay, if you went over the speed limit and the officer isn't lying, why are you pleading innocent? And you would say, well, judge, I gave $100 at church this week. And he'd say, that's great. Then I, you could probably pay your speeding ticket. And he'd say, but no, judge, you don't understand. I have my, mo my mom and my dad in their old age. You know, I haven't sent them to a nursing home. I've taken care of them. I look out for them. I make sure that they're well provided for and that they're comfortable in their old age. And, he'd, and the judge would say, good. You can definitely pay the ticket then. He'd say, but your honor, your honor. I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm, since I'm a man, I'm using this example, I'm a boy scout leader. I'm, I'm an Eagle Scout, and I have an entire troop under me. I teach them how to, you know, rough it a little bit in the woods. I teach them how to be good human beings, how to contribute to society. And the judge would say, that, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it. Be a good role model now, and pay your dues. And you'd say, your honor, all these good things that I've just mentioned, and more that I could mention, why aren't you letting this thing go? And the judge would look at you and say, you've done all these good things, you still broke the law, and you still owe the money for the speeding ticket. You're not getting out of your speeding ticket because you're a good person. You're a good person who made a mistake, but that mistake is still valid. It was still made, and you still have to pay the price. That's how judgment works. You don't get out of it because you're a good person. Judgment works in the way it does because we have sinned. We have missed the mark. We've done things that God says are evil. And by the way, in regards to good works, this is going to feel like a bit of a slap in the face, but it's in the Bible, and I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm certainly not going to apologize for my God and for what he's written in his word. It, it, it hurts to read these things, and sometimes the truth really does hurt. Legit. The truth really can hurt. But it's always best if, if you know something is true, you need to face it head on. There's no point in running away. There's no point in trying to deny it or sweeping it under the rug. Face it head on if it's the truth.
In Isaiah 64, verse, let me see. No, it should be verse 6. There we go. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. All of your good works before the God of the universe, they're about worth as much as a filthy rag is. And by the way, just to pour a little bit of salt in the wound, um, not trying to do this maliciously, but no one else ever talks about this. And I want... I want you guys to know what the Bible is really saying here because even the translation in English, it's put a little bit lighter than Isaiah actually said. If you look up the Hebrew word there for filthy rag, it's actually referring to a menstrual cloth and in the common vernacular of our day, a bloody tampon. That's what your righteousness looks like to God, a bloody tampon. And that's disgusting. That's gross. I think even in our day and age where we don't have like the laws of the Old Testament, we would pretty much all agree, with a few exceptions, that that is unclean. That's disgusting. That's what your righteousness is before God. Not only are your good works not sufficient to wipe away your judgment, your good works aren't that great. Your good works don't make you a good person. That means there's a sinner who occasionally does a good thing. You were created in the image of God from your mother's womb. You were knit together in your mother's womb by God, and he had, he had a hand in your creation. That doesn't make you perfect. You were still born to a sinful mom and dad, and you yourself are still a sinner. Part of you is still in the image of God. You can get some things right, but it's not like your righteousness is some great, wonderful, worthy thing. It's not like your righteousness gets you credit to going to heaven. Or it's or some credit list where you get enough credits and it wipes out the demerits. No. In a legal sense, when you do something wrong, regardless of how good you've been, you pay the price because you're guilty. Now the good news, the good news is that God does love you so much that he himself came to earth as Jesus and he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of all of your sins. All those things can be forgiven. And then he rose again the third day to guarantee you eternal life. And that's how you get your name written in the book of life. And I don't think I've ever mentioned this in a previous message, but if you want to read about the passion of the Christ, popular movie reference there. Thank you, Mel Gibson. You got one thing right in your life. The, let the comments explode there if you, if you guys so desire. The Passion of the Christ, um, the Last Supper all the way through the Resurrection, you can find starting Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. Um, and that will, and, well, John 18 actually doesn't cover the Last Supper. That goes straight to the Garden of Gethsemane. But you can actually read about the death and resurrection of Christ from those chapters to the end of their respective books. Once again, that is Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. Now, John 18 starts in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Last Supper actually starts, I think, back in John 15. So it's three chapters worth of dialogue, a lot more than the other Gospels. But if you're interested, that's where you can read up on what Jesus did for you. You've heard it preached a lot. And I just realized I myself never referenced like, where that is in the Bible. So I want to do that for at least one of my messages. So there is that. That is how you obtain forgiveness, by believing in what God did for you on the cross, by accepting him as your Lord and Savior, and just acknowledging that you need forgiveness that you've sinned, and you acknowledge that you've sinned. And if you want like a prayer to like kind of guide the way, lead the way, you're like, I really don't know how to put that in my own words, I'll shoot up a, a model prayer, an example prayer. And if you want to, follow these words, if, if you feel so led in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I admit I need your help. I have sinned against you. I've done wrong. I've missed the mark. Jesus, please forgive me. I believe you died on the cross, shedding your blood for my sin. And I believe that you rose again three days later, and that you're offering me eternal life right now. And that's exactly what I want. And thank you, Jesus, for saving me right now. Thank you for writing my name in your book of life. O oh, precious Lamb. Amen. 
because Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's more revelation for you, for those of you who aren't frequent churchgoers. And if you prayed that prayer, if you just accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then welcome to the family of God and welcome to the Lamb's Book of Life. It's awesome to have you. And that is, a, that is by far the most important decision you will ever make in this entire life. You have reunited with your Creator, with the God of the universe, and you are now part of His family. Welcome to the family! That's great! That is awesome! If you would, take some time to find, to find a Bible that you can read. Uh, you can, there are plenty of Bibles online, so you can use that. I personally like to have a physical copy, but find a Bible that you can read. Um, probably a more contemporary Bible. I use the new King James Version, not the original, just because it's modern English. It's a lot easier to read. Find a Bible. Read a little bit of that every day. If you want to learn about who God is, what is sin and what isn't, and what God expects from you, you're not going to find a better source than the Word of God itself. That'll teach you what God thinks about things and what's on His heart and on His mind. Also, find a church home. A bunch of people who believe the same thing as you, that Jesus is God, that He died on the cross, that He rose again. If you can find a church that believes that, it would be great to find some people there who can uplift you and bolster you in your faith and re rebuke you from time to time when you mess up. It's, it's good to be accountable to other people. That's a very good thing to have in your life. And it's a great thing to have other Christians who will just encourage you in your faith and help push you closer and closer to your new God. And finally, find a little bit of time each day to talk to him. Just a simple, God, thanks for another day, or God, today sucks, I need your help. That's a prayer. Find a little bit of time each day to talk to your God. Yeah, he knows everything. Yeah, he knows what you're going to say. But he loves it when his kids talk to him. Even if he knows everything, he wants, it. He wants you to talk to him. And, he all, and, you know, along the same lines of, well, he knows what I'm going to say, he also knows when you're not going to say it. He knows when you're not going to spend time with him. Uh, he knows when you're going to neglect him. So that kind of goes both ways. So spend some time with him. Talk to him. And, of course, that's not really for his benefit. He doesn't need anything. It's mainly for our benefit. But by praying to him and talking to him, you're engaging in that relationship with Him. You're trying to get closer to Him. So I'd like to encourage you in those things today. If you did accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and I certainly hope that this message reached a few people. Um, the One Punch Man was kind of a funny way to come at it, but this was the message that came to me as I was watching that anime this week. I was like, you know, one day God is going to punch all evil out of existence. I'm really glad I'm not part of that evil anymore. And then it was just like, you know, that's a good message right there. So guys, thank you very much for watching this. If you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching this video. Appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And hopefully this was helpful to some of you guys. I love you very much, and God bless.